I want to thank you all so much for coming tonight. Um, I'm Heather Cole, Diversity Coordinator for Olentangy Schools. Um, thank you. Um, we have a full evening planned for you. We're excited about it. Um, the theme of this conference is Building Bridges of Understanding. And um, I strongly believe that the best way to prevent misunderstanding is through relationship building, making connections, reaching out to people, listening to stories, asking questions, and that's what tonight is about. And also, if you have fun tonight and if you enjoy the evening, please come back. Our second event is at Olentangy High School on April 6th, same time, same place, same theme, or no, I'm sorry, Olentangy High School, same theme, but a completely different set of um, presenters, and instead of the general session being a keynote speaker, it's going to be a um, student panel, so you'll be able to hear from the students um, themselves. At this time, our um, superintendent, Mark Rafe, will have some remarks. Um, Mark has been a supporter of Olentangy, the, the diversity and inclusive education efforts here at Olentangy well before he was the superintendent, so we're thankful to have his support. We're thrilled to have him on board as the leader of Olentangy Local Schools. So if you could join me in welcoming Superintendent Mark Wright. Thank you, Heather. And good evening. Uh, before I make my, my remarks, I do want to take an opportunity to recognize uh, one of our school board members, uh, Mr. Roger Bartz. It's here again, I think it speaks to um, recognition of the importance of this work in our school district. So thank you again, thank you for being here. I am honored to be here this evening at the second annual Diversity and Inclusion Conference and share in such an important, relevant event. As Heather mentioned, I have long supported efforts to promote and support diversity and inclusion efforts in education. At the beginning of the school year, I shared with our staff that I'm committed to the growth of diversity and inclusion efforts within the district and the community. I'm impressed by the work of our diversity liaisons, building administrators, and classroom teachers every day, um, every single day to support this effort. Today, you can look anywhere in the district and find building communities highlighting diverse perspectives, cultures, and ideas that make up our unique experience. Whether it be a grade level diversity project at a number of buildings throughout the district or a full day, uh, <clears throat> full day experience at Shanahan Middle School or a black history assembly at Orange High School. Whether it be daily diversity club meetings at any given elementary school where kids talk through the experiences of being different and find ways to support and include one another. More and more, students are having relevant, meaningful conversations about the reality and uniqueness of the world in which we live. One of the most important contributions to this cause that each of us can do is to take advantage of continuous self-growth opportunities such as this conference. These are excellent ways for us to come together for the sharing of varied ideas thoughts, and perspectives. One of my favorite quotes to share with staff is that kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. This is proven by studies that have shown that students are five times more academically motivated when they have a sense of self-worth and believe that teachers and adults around them care. Students are 18 times more academically motivated when they have a sense of purpose and believe they can be successful. And students are four times more academically motivated when they feel that the other students in the school environment are supportive and respective of each other. The reason we're coming together tonight is to do better for our students. For our students to have a stronger sense of self-worth, for our students to have a stronger sense of belonging to their school, and the Olentangy community. I'm here to promise that we will continue to be focused on improvement in this important work. It's now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening. For more than a decade, our speaker has traveled the world entertaining, 
educating and equipping youth and adults with information and inspiration to reach excellence in their attitudes, character, and health. He's the founder and CEO of Reach Communications, Inc., and has spoken to and worked with schools, organizations, companies, and communities across the United States and around the world. The second best work Javier does is seeing people get excited about adding process to their passion. The best part of his work is coming home to his family. He's an author, speaker, trainer, and our friend. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Javier Sanchez. Good evening. Um, I wonder if I even need the microphone. Tell me in the back, do I need the microphone? Because if I don't, I won't. We're good? All right, cool. Uh, I'm so excited about being here, but like she said, I have a plane to catch, and I want to give you everything I got in the next 25, 30 minutes. And, and what I got is a lot. So we might fly through some slides, or uh, how old am I? <laughs> PowerPoint presentation. Uh, a little bit quicker than what I uh, thought about, but it's all good. I'll tell you a little bit about myself, and then we'll get into some stuff. Like you said, my name is Javier. I'm actually from Columbus, born and raised here my entire life. I love this work that I get to do uh, with caring adults and caring communities, but some of the other stuff I get to do is actually, believe it or not, I'm a stand-up comic. I, I perform on Funny Bone, some of you may have seen me in, on the Funny Bone or on Comedy Central, or, and I also get to work in uh, a little bit of stuff in film, not as an actor, so uh, don't look for me there. Um, but uh, comedy is actually one of the hardest things I do. You talk about being judged. We're here talking and celebrating cultural diversity as a comic. You are literally being judged every 8 to 12 seconds. One second, they love you because you told a joke. Eight seconds later, they hate you and they're booing you off the stage. I know from personal experience. I was in New York City and I was uh, I performed in New York City a ton of times. I was halfway th and, and I got booed. It was like so bad, like halfway through my set, uh, I tried to go gospel on them or something and just like win them back over. I'm like, I just want to thank God for this opportunity. They're like, I'm like, come on, y'all. What would Jesus do? Right? <laughs> Jesus is going to be up there telling those lame jokes or whatever, man. It was rough. So uh, uh, I know what it's like to be in, in front of rough audiences, and I can tell this is not one of those nights, and I'm so thankful for that and, and for the opportunity to be a part of the great things that are happening here in Owen Tangy. This is actually my second time speaking here. I come here uh, every year to speak to the freshmen at the beginning of the school year uh, for the past two or three years. And it's an exciting opportunity. And one of the things that I understand is, one, or like you said, I'm also a father. And, and actually, uh, a husband. I got married in uh, June of this past year, so late. Right? And, and you want to hear something really weird? Like me, one of the things that brought my wife and I together is that we are like-minded, like-hearted, and like-passionate. We are very passionate about positive change. And funny thing, at the beginning of this uh, week this week, we're kind of going over our schedules, where you're going to be, what you got going on. And uh, she works for an organization called Youth to Youth. And I said, oh, are you coming to see me speak Thursday night? And she said, I can't. I gotta, I'm got on a panel at, a, at an event that night. And I'm like, you're on a panel? I'm like, oh, so you're going to be. I was like, where, where are you going to be? She's like, well, I'll be in Olin Tangy um, speaking at a panel. So my wife is actually doing a panel tonight for your all conference. Your conference. Her name's Mylene. She's beautiful and fun to look at. So that's her. And uh, we didn't even realize we were going to be at the same place at the same time. So we should probably communicate better. <laughs> we got some work to do. <laughs> and uh, I'm also a father. And one of the most important roles I know I have as a father to help my children define who they are. I, I tell young people all the time, if you don't define who you are, someone else will define you for you. And most likely it won't be for your benefit, it'll be for theirs. So I've been very intentional about helping my children define who they are, even from when they were young. Uh, and, and I remember one time, this is a true story, I do jokes, but I'm gonna tell you a true story. Uh, my son was like five or six years old. I sat him down. Because uh, I want him to know who he is, right? And I'm like, okay, you know, Mateo, you know, uh, mommy's black and daddy's Mexican, and I'm your father, so you're black and you're Mexican. He said, I'm not black. I said, what are you talking about you're not black? He said, I'm not black, I'm brown. I said, dude, you're confused, man. I'm not talking about skin color, I'm talking about, like, who you are. You know what I'm saying? Mommy's black, you're black. And he said, mommy's not black. I'm like, bro, you're so confused. I'm, I'm trying to help you out, man. I was like, what are you talking about mommy's not black? He said, mommy's light brown. I'm like, dude, you're confused, man. Let me help you figure this out. I said, but hold on, man. I said, if mommy is light brown, what does that make daddy? He said, you're dark white. 
right? <laughs> I said, you're an idiot. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say that at all, man. But I love uh, seeing my children define who they are as they, as they uh, grow older. Uh, you know, he's 15 now, and my daughter just started uh, middle school. She's a sixth grader, and, 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 I, and I love her. And she came home uh, last year, and she was upset. And I was like, what's going on, baby? She said, that we're learning about government and social studies, and they put us in groups, and each of our small groups we were supposed to represent different members of government, and my group wouldn't let me be who I wanted to be uh, uh, in our group. And I said, well, who'd you want to be, baby? And she said, I wanted to be president, but they wouldn't let me be president. And I said, why wouldn't they let you be president? Because you're a girl? She said, no, because I'm Mexican. And I said, wow. I said, wow, that's crazy. I'm like, you know, I started thinking about it. When we don't know, well, I, I'm like, who are you running against? Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because when you don't know, you start making stuff up, right? When we don't know, we start making stuff up. And I started thinking about when our current president, Barack Obama, first got into office, we didn't know a lot. And so some people, we started making stuff up. And I'm not talking about his politics or the direction he wanted to take the country. I'm talking about things that were completely insignificant to his presidency. You'll remember uh, when he first got in office uh, eight years ago, I remember like one day all the news could talk about was like what kind of dog the first family was going to have, what kind of pet they were going to have. And I'm like, yeah. Maybe, maybe we're not ready for a Mexican president, right? People would really lose their mind. If a Mexican gets in office, they're like, oh my God, they're gonna have like a pet donkey named Tito or something, right? <laughs> Wild chickens running around the White House lawn. Because when you don't know, you start making stuff up, right? Another day, all the news could talk about was the fact that the president's mother-in-law was moving into the White House. The, Michelle Obama's mother was moving in. And I'm like, really, one extra person? You're worried about one extra person moving in the White House? Again, can you imagine what would happen if a Mexican was <laughs> when you don't know, you start making stuff up. They're like, oh my goodness, have you seen how many people they can fit in El Camino? Right? Do you know what they would do to Air Force One? Right? It's like California, Vamanos. Right? When you don't know, you start making stuff up. They think a Mexican president would be like five foot two or something, right? With a big tattoo of the White House across his chest or something. La Casa Blanca por Vida, right? White House for life. Because when you don't know, you start making stuff up. And when you don't know who you are or who someone else is, you start making stuff up. And the problem isn't that we start making stuff up. The problem is that we don't know. And why, don't we, know, why do we not know? It's because we don't take the time to know. We don't take the time to know. And here's what you need to understand. There's a theory called the 7-Eleven theory. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it. 7-Eleven theory is this. Basically, in seven seconds, we come to about 11 conclusions about somebody we don't know that we've met for the first time. In seven seconds, you come to 11 conclusions about somebody you're meeting for the first time. And what that means is we have to ask ourselves, where are those conclusions coming from? They're coming from, uh, if we've never met this person, they're coming from uh, perceptions of we, uh, that we have of people we've maybe experienced in our past that look like that person. And if it's a negative experience, we're projecting that negative experience onto this person. And even if we've never had real interaction with a person that looks like the person that we're uh, meeting for the first time, we're basing those 11 conclusions on what we've been told those people are like based on what we've seen in the media, what we've seen in the news, what we've seen in movies and videos, and, and what we've read about and heard about from other people. In the first seven seconds, you come to 11 conclusions about somebody you've never met before. Isn't that fair? Well, we do it for safety. You know, we, you know, we do it for survival. It's a uh, natural instinct. But there's another word for it. First of all, basically, we don't know that we don't know that we don't know, right? And then the other word for it is implicit bias. We don't know what we don't know about somebody. We're making unconscious assessments of somebody that we a lot of times don't even realize it. And if you look at you know the the, the high rate of uh, incarceration, the high rate of uh, expulsion and suspension of uh, uh, you know our young black and brown males, you wonder if implicit bias doesn't play a part in that. I was speaking in a middle school, uh, full school assembly, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders in a very uh, fluent community. And um, they had me in the gymnasium, had 900 6th, 7th, and 8th graders 
on one side of the gymnasium and I'm going in and I'm having a great time, you know, and I've, I've performed comedy in front of rough audiences and I've also done school assemblies in front of rough audiences. I've done assemblies in Bushwick, Brooklyn, or uh, New York. I've done uh, assemblies in Compton, California. I've been to the guts, right? I know what a tough audience looks like. This was not a tough audience, okay? This was a cakewalk presentation. 900 young people uh, in the past three years, they had seen a huge influx uh, of new faces in the community. You had 900 young people uh, sitting in the bleachers and you had about 20 or 30 teachers lined up along the walls, not sitting in the bleachers with their students. Yeah, I had them going, I had them riled up, I had them laughing, carrying on. Some of them a little rambunctious, but nothing that I could uh, not handle. I've been there before, I had experienced it before. I watched during my 45 minute presentation, 10 students get pulled out of this presentation. All 10 of them were black. All 10 of them were African American uh, young people. And I know it wasn't just 10 young people, uh, 10 African American young people that, that were uh, making noise. We find what we're looking for, we're looking for. If you look for a problem in somebody or in something, you're gonna find it. I'll show you an example. Let me tell me about this word. Where's everybody's eyes at right now? All we can see is that E. We see the one thing that's wrong with that word and completely forget about the one, two, three, four, five things that are right with it. We've been trained to focus on the negative. We've been trained to find the negative. We do it all the time and we don't even think about it. What's that box that's on the, uh, at the front of a restaurant called before you walk out? What's that box called? Comment box. What do we save it for? Complaints. It doesn't say complaint box. Tell us everything we're doing wrong, but that's all we reserve it for. We find what we're looking for uh, in life and in people. So the question is, what are you looking for when you encounter somebody for the first time that may be a little different from you? When we focus on the negative, we magnify the negative. And when you magnify something, what you're doing is making it appear bigger than what it really is. That's what magnifying something is. That's what you're doing. We find what we're looking for. The question is, when you encounter someone different from you, what are you looking for? And what are you basing those decisions on? What you know or what you think you know or what you've heard from somebody else? Get to know someone. The second uh, reason why we don't know what we don't know, number one is implicit bias, number two is something called confirmation bias. And, and this is a relatively, in some ways, new phenomenon. <clears throat> because what now what we go looking for, we form opinions, we come to conclusions, and then we go looking for answers and perceptions that reinforce what we already believe. We go looking for those places on the internet. We go looking for those uh, or those uh, reinforcements on in social media. We look for them in the news channels that we that we uh, tune into. We decide what we know. We decide what we believe. We decide how we feel about something. And then here's the here's the crazy thing about it. When you're doing searches on Google, for example, Google uh, studies your algorithms and they'll start feeding you the information that you're looking for. They'll start feeding you things based on what you're constantly doing searches for. So the, a lot of times the information we're looking for is just reinforcement <coughs> of ideas that we already believe. When you go on Facebook and you're liking people's posts and you're liking pe uh, articles that other people are putting up and you're reading articles and clicking on information that reinforce ideas and beliefs that you already have instead of challenging them, Facebook figures that out and guess what they start feeding you? More of the ideas and beliefs that you already have. Ideas and beliefs that confirm what you already think you know. And then it's really crazy with uh, uh, social media because once we start scrolling through our timeline we start liking this article and we like this person's comment about uh, uh, that when they share this opinion and Facebook starts feeding us what, what we what, what they know, what Facebook knows we want to see and read and have reinforced in our lives. Anybody with an opposing view, anybody who has, uh, that looks at the world a little bit different from us, what do we do to them? We start blocking them. 
We start deleting them. And so we create this insulated world of misunderstanding on social, via, via Google and social media. And so, because all our biases are being confirmed by the information that we're constantly uh, being fed and that we're constantly seeking out. Implicit bias, confirmation bias, and why else? Uh, and one of the reasons why we don't know what we don't know is, is a term called proximic affiliation. Proximic affiliation uh, is basically who we affiliate with is a lot of times based on who's in uh, uh, proximity to us, and who is in, who's in proximity to us most likely are people that look like us or come from similar backgrounds and experience. So it looks a lot like this. You know, number one is self, number two is family, number three is our tribe, number four is our community. And we affiliate with these people that we're close, most closely connected to. And, um, you know, and we first look out for ourselves when it comes to protection, provision, and support, and then that extends to our family, and then our tribe, and then our community. And there are different kinds of tribes that we form around ourselves, and different kinds of communities that we form around ourselves. But most of the time, the affiliations that we create are with people uh, that look uh, most like us and come from similar backgrounds and similar experiences and similar uh, cultures. And, uh, and the root of that, uh, uh, you know, our, nat our natural instinct when it comes to who we protect, who we provide for, and who we support, you know, it goes back to one of our uh, basic instincts, which is survive, right? And so what drives these things a lot of times, or what drives our natural instinct to survive, is fear. And if you think about it, we haven't had to use uh, fear as an instinct for survival uh, for a pretty long time. You know, that sort of went out with the, okay, with the Stone Age. You know, we don't, uh, you know, we don't have to think like that anymore. We're in the 21st century. We don't have to live in fear. And what's the opposite of fear? Fear is the misuse of imagination. And we see that with the 7-Eleven theory. We, we're, uh, when you're coming to these conclusions, a lot of times you're misusing your imagination. And the opposite of fear is courage. <laughs> and if we are going to build bridges of understanding here in Olentangy, we have to have the courage to create a culture of care. And what it means to create a culture of care is this. Number one, we must celebrate cultural diversity. Understand that race, the term race, race is a social construct. It's not a scientific or biological uh, uh, construct. It's a social construct. It really wasn't created until like uh, the 18th century. So, you know, there really is only one race, the human race. You know, we figured out different ways to divide ourselves up. But ultimately, we are the human race. So it's not about celebrating different races. It's about celebrating different cultures. A diversity of cultures is worth celebrating. And, and that's something we need to be intentional about doing. Finding, having experiences and events like this sets the stage for creating intentional opportunities to celebrate uh, cultural diversity here in Old Texas. We need to acknowledge that there is diversity. We need to uh, accept that there is diversity and allow there to be diversity. Diversity in thought, diversity in culture. And how do we do that? By formally and informally considering what are we doing to ensure that every person and every from every culture in this community, in our homes, in our schools, knows that they are safe, valued, and necessary. Those are informal conversations, parents, we need to have around our kitchen table with our young people and on our, on our way to and from schools. Those are informal conversations, young people, that you can have uh, sitting in the cafeteria or hanging out at Polaris. There are also formal conversations and experiences we can create here. This is a formal opportunity to consider what we are doing to ensure every person in this community knows they are safe, valued, and necessary. And parents and adults and adults starts by modeling the attitudes and behavior we expect to see from our young people. Modeling that attitude and behavior. Everybody hold this up real quick. Hold up that okay sign. Hold up the okay sign. Everybody got that? Cool. Put that right on your chin. Put that right on your chin. 
On your chin. On your chin. On your chin. I'll wait, sir. What's this about? <laughs> Where did you put it? You put it in. He still got it. <laughs> You put it on your cheek, why? Because I put it on my cheek. If you're going to talk the talk, you have to walk the walk, okay? Model the attitudes and behavior we expect to see from our young people. And our young people, I'll tell you what, uh, parents, teachers, and adults, our young people aren't waiting for us to figure it out, okay? I have so much hope in this generation, that's why I give so much time, effort, and energy to this generation. Because I call this generation the we have had enough generation. They have had enough of the way things have gone, and they are ready to do things differently. As I travel around the world, and, and you know, again, you watch the news and pay attention, you would think everything's going wrong, but when I work with our young people, I see everything that is going right. I tell young people all the time, the change is not happening to them, it's happening through them. And if there's going to be a change for the better in our world, our countries, our communities, and our schools, it's not just going to happen because of what politicians are doing, or, doing, or preachers, or parents, or teachers are doing. It's happening because of what young people are doing. Young people have had enough, and it's exciting to see them in action uh, here in Only Tangy and in almost every school district I go to, and it's just an awesome uh, thing to behold. So we need to celebrate cultural diversity. We need to uh, acknowledge, accept, and allow it. We need to uh, master our responsibility. You know what the 7-Eleven theory is now. You can't say you don't know. You can't say you don't know what we've done. And so now we have to become masters of our respondability. How are you responding when you are confronted with an opportunity uh, to engage somebody that is different from you? That is your choice. That is one of the most amazing things as a human being is our power to choose. You can think, choose, and decide how you are going to respond to people that are different from you. And so it's up to you. What are you doing with your seven seconds? from this moment on. And we need to be intentional about being empathetic, putting ourselves in other people's shoes, right? A friend of mine, Kevin Wander, uh, said uh, this quote, the greatest difference you can make in the world is when you make a difference to somebody different from you. This is an opportunity to create uh, that experience. I'm glad I wasn't introduced as a, a motivational speaker. I hate uh, being called a motivational speaker. <coughs> motivational speakers are really good at creating powerful moments, and that's not good enough for me because we'll all feel good when we leave here, and then when we go back to our normal lives and normal experiences and normal biases, um, everything that went and happened here uh, just you know dissipates and goes away. What I'm excited about in terms of what's going on at uh, Ola and Tangy, and I've already told Heather I'm happy to come back uh, in April and, and do a workshop and, you know, we can roll our sleeves up and talk about how to be intentional about creating that uh, environment in our schools and communities where every uh, person from every culture knows their safe, value, and necessary. Uh, so what I'm excited about is that this is not a powerful movement in all, or a moment in Ola and Tangy, but it happens for a powerful movement. You have the support of your district, your superintendent, wonderful staff here at Ola Tangy, and by the turnout here tonight, it, it, it's very clear that we have the support of teachers and parents, and so I'm excited about what you all are doing, and I'm excited that it's not just a moment, but it's an actual uh, movement, because you recognize how important it is, how, how vital it is. I get to do comedy, I get to speak, and I get to do workshops, and I also get to do spoken word poetry, and I want to share a piece with you called VAN, and you understand what VAN means. Uh, at the end of it. In this piece, I'm going to speak on behalf of many uh, people, many young people, uh, even some adults, who maybe feel like they don't have a voice, and I'll be their voice. And uh, so as you hear this piece, think about, reflect on what you've done, uh, uh, what choices you've made personally, uh, and what you are intentional about doing from this moment on to create this culture and this community of care here in uh, Old Intangy. And um, as I live and breathe, I realize I'm one of the last of a live and breathe. Call me a poet, a griot, a voice for the voiceless, or an MC. Call me a father, a lover, a brother. Call me everything I was meant to be. Or call me a comic and an author and a storyteller.
color. Call me everything I was sent to be. I want the dictionary's definition of passion and creativity to mention me. Can't you see? It feels good to love yourself unconditionally, intentionally, and with intensity. But if only it were that easy. See, we love us some hate, don't we? See, we've been taught to hate to see other people win. And we love when other people's inner life dims and when their life's looking grim. Because then it makes our life a little more bearable. But does that seem fair to you? That for my life to be good, yours has to be terrible? Peep the parable. See, I think hate is a weak excuse for laziness. It's a way to reduce the true feelings that we're scared to express. See, I don't think you hate me. I think you're afraid of me. And I know that sounds like craziness, but I dare you to go ahead and confess. See, you don't hate the fact that I'm ethnic, and English is my second language, and questionable immigration laws make me an open target. I think you're afraid of me because of my work ethic, and because I speak two languages to your one, and you know what? That makes me more valuable in a global market. <laughs> so now you're telling me that, 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 that you hate me just because I wear glasses, I get doctor's notes to avoid gym classes, I love computers, and I have a 4.30 GPA. <laughs> but I don't think that's it, uh-uh. I think you're just afraid of me, because unlike you, I don't conform to the masses. I have a clear vision of my future, and you know what? Guess what? I, I bet you'll probably be working for me someday. And wow, you're telling me that you hate me just because I'm attracted to my same sex? I mean, if anything, you should thank me. Because that means me and my partner, we're two less people that you have to compete with for the affections of the opposite sex. Unless your hatred really matched your own insecurity. Because you hurt me and screaming that you're looking at your own uh, sexuality with uncertainty. And if you don't believe me, ask anybody who knows anything about psychology and they'll be like, mm, certainly. <laughs> wow. I don't get it. But you're telling me that you hate me just because I'm the new kid in school. And because my clothes aren't that nice and my shoes aren't that new. I mean, did you know that both my parents lost their jobs and that's why we had to move? Or maybe you're just afraid. You're afraid that my poverty is contagious and that what I have might rub off of me and stick to you. Look here, I already have to come to school and wonder and worry about when the next time I'm going to eat is. But now you're telling me I have to come here and wonder and worry about how I'm going to get treated? Oh man, believe you me, I just don't need it. You're telling me that you hate me because I'm quiet, I keep to myself, and I'm not the most popular girl in the school. But I don't think that's it. I think you're just afraid of me. Because unlike you, I'm not dying for everyone's attention. And I don't have to have everyone know this, everything I say, everything I do. Because guess what? I'm just not that needy. And I know you see me, but you don't hate me because of my rap music, my flashy clothes, or my braided hair. I think you're afraid of me because of my endurance and my determination, and because despite what my ancestors went through, and guess what? What my people still go through, I can stand right here with a defiant stare and say, just like Malcolm Martin, Oprah, Obama, and my mama, I am going somewhere. So come hear my people, come and hear my people. I didn't come to preach, I came to hear my people, because when I hear my people becoming POWs and MIA, that's prisoners of words, and missing in adolescence, it makes me pray, oh God, can we please adolescents in this day, learn this, every single word that comes out of your mouth to or about someone is pushing them one step closer to life, or one step closer to death. So recognize the power and potential of every word that's carried on your breath. And know this, no one can make you feel inferior. You have to give them permission. So understand where their hate and their venom is really coming from. It's just a simple-minded suggestion designed to distract and detour you from your mission. And if seeing is believing, then nothing should be clearer. Just force yourself to see beauty, power, intelligence, and strength every time you look in the mirror. And anything special you think you see in me is really just a reflection of your own specialness, your own greatness, your own amazingness, and your own energy. See, I'm just blessed to be standing here basking in the light of your presence because your presence is a present that can only be received when you are physically, spiritually, mentally, and emotionally present. So understand, I want you to learn this lesson. And more importantly, into your heart, I want you to burn this lesson. 
Understand, I want you to hear this lesson clearly. See, every single one of you are valuable and necessary. Understand, I want you to feel this lesson clearly. Every single one of you are valuable and, un and necessary. Understand, I want you to live this lesson clearly because every single one of you are valuable and necessary. Now help me out and share this lesson clearly. It starts here, but we gotta take it out there. But we can practice it before we perform it by telling everyone around you, in front of you, behind you, beside you, right now, that they are valuable and necessary. Let them know. Go ahead and let them know. All the people around you, tell them how valuable and necessary they are. Everybody around you, don't let anybody get left out. You're valuable and necessary. You're valuable. You're valuable. You're valuable and necessary. Every single one of us are valuable and necessary. Thank you so much. My name is Javier.